Charles Bukowski said that love is a fog that burns away with the first daylight of reality. I love that quote. Uh, do you think romantic love fades away in this way? Bukowski. Uh, does, it, does it have to fade? The truth is that you have all of these chemicals pumping through your body. You're essentially high on heroin in the beginning of a romance. And you're going to have these rose-colored glasses on. Everything your partner does is magical. But really, it's the novelty. It's just like going on a vacation. You're fully present. You're just attuned to the magic of another human being moment to moment. And then on top of that, you have, you're just flooded with dopamine. So you're high on drugs. And we can't go on like that. You will die if you are using these kinds of chemicals all the time, all day long. So eventually, our bodies are sort of made to dial it down. We've made it. I mean, we're evolutionary beings. We are doing the same thing we did 200,000 years ago to find a mate, procreate, spend enough time with each other that we have sex a whole bunch of times and make babies. Now we've changed the rules of the game. We're living, you know, almost till we're 100 years old. In some cases, we're making these marriage commitments that last half a century. And uh, we're expecting it to be all because of love. And we're signing these contracts based on how we feel when we're high on these drugs. So the reality is we know based on the re- – and, and I'm also talking about certain Western civilizations here because, as you know, there are arranged marriages. And a lot of times those marriages, if we're looking at longevity, are actually way more satisfied than people who are marrying for love, which – logically makes sense. If you're making a decision based on a feeling that is basically based on endorphins and dopamine and oxytocin, I wouldn't sign a contract just because of a feeling necessary, you know, for 50 years. Whereas an arranged marriage, if you have your elders kind of deciding for you that this partner has a bunch of traits that you're going to appreciate more and more over time, I think there's some wisdom there. So you don't think that feeling could be a foundation for a 50-year relationship. Well, I don't think that specific feeling you're having based on drugs yeah. is going to be the same feeling you have 20, 30, 40 years down the line. If you're going to wake up and turn to your partner when you're 70 and think, "Oh my god, I'm so glad you're hot. You are so hot." Yeah. Then sure, marry for hotness. Yeah. But if you've been through life a little bit, and I think most people who are on a second marriage know, shit happens in life. It is hard. You're going to have, you know, maybe a kid with special needs or your dad gets dementia um, or you get diagnosed with cancer. Who are you going to want to come home to? Who is going to hold you when you are sobbing on the floor and tell you we're going to get through it together? Who's going to know the names of your kid's special ed teacher and the process for getting a 504 plan? Or is it going to be you on your own? I think those things matter. But doesn't that hotness, don't those drugs kind of solidify into a deeper appreciation of the other person, into something you could call beauty? Yes. Uh, they can. But but isn't that the same isn't that the same thing? When you know when you notice the beauty of another human being, aren't you aren't you high on drugs still? <laughs> You're making it sound like there's like a a brief rock star period of going on heroin and then it's over. But like, can't you be on heroin your whole life? A little I bit. have some good news. I have some good news. That was something, I think one of the reasons I got into studying relationships was because I wanted that, right? So I'm a scientist, but I also love art and I love writing and I love literature. I wanted to know that true love could be real. But as a scientist, uh, I am cynical. I just need some data. Mm. And when So I practice a type of therapy called the Gottman Method, and I love that because it tends to be, well, it is one of the most evidence-based therapies we have based on John and Julie Gottman, two psychologists who have been researching relationships for now about 50 years, and this therapy happens to be for couples. They found that you absolutely can make longevity work in a relationship. You can build. You are not just settling for companionship, but you can have passion and intimacy and growing love and appreciation. But there is a blueprint, a set of skills that we were never given. We're not taught it in school. We changed the rules of the game, and we haven't learned the rules yet. And uh, the Gottman Method for Couples Therapy kind of gives you a few guidelines, the rules for right. the longevity yeah. in a relationship. Yeah, they did a beautiful job at taking these findings they had through you know decades of research 
quantifying it and then codifying it into a therapy method. It's really skills-based. I tell couples when they're starting out with me that they're essentially going to be starting a class. So what's the five to one golden rule? What I read is there's the kind of balance you can achieve of uh, how many interactions you have in a relationship that are positive versus negative. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's what the five to one means. But basically there should be a, kind of an empirical, like if you just look back yeah. over over a month, how many of the interactions were positive? How many were negative? Or the day, look at the day. Right. So the idea of this ratio, um, well, it's not an idea. It was a finding. It is a research finding that the Gottmans got after looking at thousands of couples um, and codifying these interactions that they were observing. Couples that tend to be satisfied in their relationships, um, that are happier, they have better health, et cetera, they are having approximately five positive interactions to each negative. And I want to be clear about what I'm defining as positive and negative here. So this doesn't necessarily mean that you're, these don't need to be big sweeping romantic gestures, buying flowers, having sex. These are things like paying attention to what we call your partner's bids. Um, we make these bids for affection, for connection, all the time in our relationships, not just with our partners, but with our friends, our coworkers. And we may not even know what our style of bid is, but if you see them on a sheet, you can pretty quickly identify them. Bids could be wanting to show your partner or tell your partner something and have them be proud of you. It could be wanting to go buy groceries with your partner, doing things together. Hey, you want to come with me? It could be telling a joke and hoping that uh, your wife looks up from her email on the computer and acknowledges it. If she laughs, then you've got a positive. But if I don't even look up, that's a negative, right? So it's not necessarily that I'm calling my husband an asshole. It's just, am I connecting with him? Am I meeting those bids for connection and vice versa? But do those also give you a guide of how you should behave? Well, I think what's really important is actually asking your partner or paying attention to what your partner's bids are, because what matters to Ty, my husband, may not matter to you. For instance, I mean, Ty's bar is so low with me. I thank God <laughs> in for terms him. Of what defines a positive interaction? <laughs> right. Like he just wants me to ask him if he wants a water when I get up to get myself one. Right. Just be a basic, decent, considerate person is all he asks of me. Whereas mine might be sort of like stay up later with me, watch a show. Um, go to bed at the same time as me or um, know about the people in my life, that sort of a thing. I should highlight this, and I hope hopefully it's okay, that you were running a little bit late and you <laughs> sent me this text, which is which people do really rarely, and there's a subtle act of kindness within that text. So the, the, you, the, the text you sent was that... Um, I just decreased the amount of stress in your life or something like this you by did. saying it's, it's cool. But that means that you were you were you're signaling that you were stressed because you care enough to be there on time mm -hmm. and that was like that made me feel really special it's like oh you know people you're don't often guy. people don't often don't always do that because that puts you also that makes you vulnerable, vulnerable. and that, i actually thought that after i sent it mm -hmm. but i feel that most of the day <laughs> Any interaction, like, oh, God, I just exposed myself. But absolutely, I was excited to be here, and I didn't want you to uh, think that I didn't care. I think being a therapist has shown me that it really, it's so lucky to be in that position because you meet people that you would have thought are cooler than you or smarter than you or just somehow impervious to life, and you realize that we are all in it together. We all want to be cared about and liked. We don't want to be liked as a baseline. I Some people will say they don't care, but everybody does. It's human. And I have gotten much better being a therapist, much more comfortable showing caring, showing love, and genuineness and vulnerability than I think I ever would have been otherwise. And that kind of vulnerability is what's required to do a positive interaction in a relationship? I think so. And and people have different levels of comfort, right? So, um, but as long as it's working for both partners, and typically you have to communicate to figure out what your partner, what makes your partner feel cared about. However, you might be working, for instance, with an older couple, and 
I have a couple that's perfectly happy and they sort of have a system. It works for them. If there's some sort of a rupture, if they get in some sort of a disagreement, they don't talk it out. She might go to the store, run an errand, doing do a little shopping. He'll work in the wood shop and then they'll come back and there is a repair attempt though, but it's mm -hmm. maybe she'll say, hey, do you want to have dinner or come you know, I made your favorite dinner and, or he'll say, Hey, I recorded your favorite show. You want to watch it tonight? So they don't need to process it, but there is an understanding between them that we're still in this together. We care about each other and there's a repair attempt. Most people need to be able to process it verbally and talk about what happened, oh, but not all. So for most people, if there's a conflict, you should talk about it and resolve it and repair it versus like, just put it behind you? I, I don't want to say should. I guess it depends on the couple. Yeah. Everybody processes emotions differently. Everybody handles emotional expression differently. I mean, I have couples where I have one person in the partnership who has autism and the other doesn't. And so they're obviously going to have different ways of communicating or processing what happened. We all have different perspectives. It really depends on what makes a person feel like it's been repaired. What makes a person feel understood? Does that need to be verbal? Or in the case of that older couple I have where they know they understand one another because there's a gentleness toward one another after.